So welcome to our Suffolk Libraries Day online book festival. I'm Lisa, I'm the Reader Development Librarian for Suffolk Libraries. And as a charity, our annual fundraising day, Suffolk Libraries Day is vitally important to us. And we are so grateful for all your support and donations. Thank you so much. And for this evening's event, I am so pleased and delighted to introduce the amazingly fabulous best-selling author, Ellie Griffiths. Welcome, so um, Ellie, and thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thank you. I'm so delighted to be back here. Yeah, wonderful to be back with Suffolk Libraries. It's fantastic. Fantastic. Thank you so much again. And our first question this evening, my colleague Melissa is going to ask. So over to you, Melissa. Yes, Ellie. Hi. Hi. Uh, so first off, we'd like to know, um, how did it feel to see your first book published? It's really interesting that you should say that, Melissa, because today I was clearing out the attic. It's like we've done all the... Um, lockdown tasks in the house and now we're up in the attic clearing that out and uh, I found all these um, manuscripts of books that I wrote that didn't get published and I'd almost forgotten that they were there you know and, and it was you know big sheaves of paper and most of them sort of written on a typewriter so you can imagine some effort it went to type that and, and none of them got published and there were some of the rejection letters so uh, it made me remember what it was like with my first book which was called The Italian Quarter, and it was written under my real name, which is Domenica De Rosa, when that was published. And, and I can still rem remember the feeling, not even so much the feeling when it was actually out, but the feeling um, when, when I knew that somebody wanted to publish it and somebody thought it was good enough to be published. And it just felt the most incredible feeling because I have wanted to be a writer for as long as I can remember. And I, I almost thought it wasn't gonna happen, you know? And it was, it was just, bef uh, just before, I wasn't quite 40 and publishing is the only place in the world where you can be like a, a new young writer <laughs> when you're nearly 40. So, you know, it took a long time, but it was an amazing feeling, a really amazing feeling. And it was more that um, I sort of felt well, I, I, I had been right to, to keep going and to keep trying because th there were a lot of rejection. There were lots of years when I thought it was never going to get published. So it, it was an incredible feeling. And actually following up really well on that question, Camilla has asked, why did you start writing professionally? Was it because it was always a dream of yours to become an author? Oh, Melissa, that's a great question. Yeah, it always was a dream of mine to become an author. So I, um, even before I started school, so before I could write properly, I used to write these, make these little little um, picture books and my dad I remember used to sew the, 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 them together like sew a little spine on them and they were little picture books so I was already wanting to make books and didn't really quite know where that came from but when I was 11 I wrote my first full-length book and it was a crime novel and it was called The Hair of the Dog which must have been something I'd heard my parents talk about. I don't think I know what it meant. You know, the hair of the dog that bit you is a thing that makes you better. It's something people usually say when they're a bit hungover. So my parents must have said that. Um, so, but it was a crime novel as well. So, you know, even at 11, I knew that's what I wanted to do. But the funny thing is, yeah, when I was at secondary school, I used to write these little episodes of Starsky and Hutch. I don't know if there are any Skalski and Hutch fans out there, um, but I used to write, because that was a big TV thing at the time, and I used to write these little episodes and I would take them into school and all my classmates would read them. And I remember I wrote an episode where Starsky dies. And um, I remember they were sort of passed around in class, people would be reading them, and people started to cry. And I quite liked that. I liked that I could make them cry, you know, and I, I sort of thought, that oh, more, I, thought it was that, I thought, yeah, I thought, oh, I maybe I know how to do this. But the funny thing was that, that then, you know, if you were to say to somebody and I often go into schools and uh, kids often ask, you know, how do I become a writer? And the wonderful thing is there is no one way. And, you know, writers come from all sorts of places. But I kind of did all the right things. I read English at university. Uh, after university, I worked in a library in London for a little while. Then I went to work in publishing. But funny enough, working in publishing kind of put me off because publishing is very corporate. I mean, that's not wrong, you know. And publishers are there, unlike libraries. Libraries are there just to celebrate books. And that's true. 
They're just there to sell it books and to get people reading. But publishers are there to make money. So working in publishing did slightly put me off wanting to write a book. So it wasn't until I was on maternity leave, actually expecting my twins, who are now 22, that I wrote what became my first published book. So quite a long journey, sort of joining on from the first question, uh, but it was something that I always, always wanted to do. And one of the things that you mentioned um, initially, Ellie, is obviously Ellie isn't your real name. Um, you wrote, you started to write crime books, so you needed a crime name. And um, I know from when we've spoken before that Ellie is based on your grandmother's name. After all these years, so many of us call you Ellie. <laughs> we think of you as Ellie. Have you ever got used to that? Yes, I have. Yeah, exactly. As you said, my, first, my real name is Domenica, Domenica De Rosa, which is a funny thing, really, because it sounds made up. It really does. I know we've said that before. That's the one that sounds, you know, like a pseudonym. But it's my real name is Italian. My dad was Italian. And I was first published as Domenica De Rosa. So uh, as, as, as you said, Lisa, when my first when I wrote The Crossing Places, uh, my agent said, oh, she said, oh, this is crime. You need a crime name. So I thought my grandmother was Ellen Griffith. So I thought that that uh, would, was quite a good name. My grandma, I didn't know her terribly well. She died when I was five, but I knew she loved books and she loved reading. So I thought she would be pleased. And um, when I was a publisher, something we always used to say to, to writers was that um, if you go into a bookshop or a library, A's up there, Z's down there, but on I level is FGH. So you should have an FGH name. So that was another reason why I chose uh, Ellie Griffiths. I wanted to be Ellen Griffiths. So my grandmother was called Ellen Griffiths. And for some reason, when the book came out, I was Ellie. And I remember saying to my editor, I'm really lucky I've had the same editor for all the books. I said to her, why Ellie? And she said, oh, she said, I don't know. I, I just think it looked a bit tidier. And if you see, it does look quite tidy. There, between hey, the I two love, the I'm that's me, I've got my coffee. So and I do I love just how they put your name just, together became Ellie because it fitted in the, the, the typeface better. But um, in answer to your question, yeah, I do answer to Ellie now. And I, you know, I probably do think, you know, you know, those silly little quizzes and things you get on Facebook. If your name is Ellie, then I do look at Ellie now because because well, you're never going to see Domenica. Or in Starbucks, when we went into place like Starbucks and they ask your name for the cup, I usually say Ellie because nobody can say Domenica anyhow. I was um, obviously we were just showing your latest book, The Nighthawks, and I was ridiculously excited when your publisher sent me an advanced copy. And I, I saw the lovely video you did with Gus, bless him, yes. and opened the box from your publishers. Do you still get an immense thrill? Yes, yeah. It, 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 it's such an it is such an exciting feeling, and you never get over that slight feeling of thinking that it's never going to make it to be an actual proper shiny looking book like that you know and so when when you open it up and it is there it it, it really is such a thrill yeah so I I, I normally take a little video of me opening that the books and my cat Gus she's not here tonight he's in the house normally he's here in the shed um he he's obviously so bored now because when my books first when I first got those box of books he was like looking in it he was all excited and now I just showed him the book and he's like yeah okay there's another book it's not very exciting is it and sort of walked off so he's a bit blase but I'm still excited I don't think you're ever going to get over that feeling of the fact when it's an actual book you know and it you know it's all shiny my publishers do beautiful covers I think and they always look really lovely so yes they do and actually Nicola who's watching asked to see Gus so oh, sorry I'm sorry. Nicola yeah, I'm sorry, he's not, he's not here at the moment. I can hear a dog barking somewhere. Maybe that's what's putting him off coming up to the shed because it's at the top of the garden. He might come. You might hear an unearthly yowling. In fact, earlier on today, early on in this interview, I was saying that we were up in the loft today, Andy and I, and Gus was obviously, it was a shocking because he was abandoned in the house. And he started yowling at the bottom of the attic steps. It was so unearthly. So he might do that in a bit. <laughs> I see um he's so gorgeous oh um, he is a very good boy um obviously this is your 13th 
Dr. Ruth Galloway book, which is extraordinary. And, you know, you've been writing about Ruth and Nelson for so long now. Do they feel like old friends to you? Like when we read the books, do they come alive for you as a writer when you're writing the books? Y yes, they do. And, and um, whenever I start writing a new Ruth book, as you say, this is 13, but I should tell everyone out there that I'm busy writing 14 now. So, oh, brilliant, uh, because so, Jean has already asked oh, that good. question. <laughs> she wants more. So I am writing number 14, and uh, whenever I start, because what, what happens is usually I write a Ruth book, and then I write another book, so either Brighton Mystery or um, a standalone. So we always have that moment just before I start thinking, oh, I hope I can still get Ruth, you know, I hope I can still be her. But, but so far, touch wood, touch wood, it's always happened. And, you know, it, it feels quite quite nice to be, to be back with her and Nelson. I always, because I, I teach creative writing and I always say to my students, oh, you know, they're just words on the page. They're not real. You can make them do what you want. But of course, it's not like that, really. You know, they do feel like they have a life of their own now. And for those in the audience that have yet to read your latest book in the series, are you able to give them a little bit of a taste of what to expect from the story? Yes, of course. So, yes, it's the Nighthawks, Ruth number 13, the first in the series. Of, uh, and I know there'll be people that haven't read any of them. So the first one's called The Crossing Places. And The Crossing Places starts with a, a forensic archaeologist called Dr Ruth Galloway. Um, and uh, she works at a, a made up university in North Norfolk called the University of North Norfolk. And she goes into work one day and finds that there is a, that there's a detective waiting for her outside her office. Um, and my husband's an archaeologist, so I know that the police do um, do use archaeologists when they find buried bones. So this this is Detective uh, Chief Inspector Harry Nelson, and he wants Ruth's help because he's found some buried bones on marshland near her house. Um, and Ruth goes to look at them, uh, but knows immediately as soon as she sees them that they're actually prehistoric, they're 2000 years old, but she's drawn into the investigation and into a very complicated relationship with the policeman, DCI Harry Nelson. So without giving too much away sort of along the way, so now we're at book 13, and book 13 starts when a group of metal detectorists uh, find a body on the beach in North Norfolk. And Nighthawks is a name sometimes given to unlicensed metal detectorists, really sort of unscrupulous people who, who take things fr from archaeological sites. This group are not unscrupulous, though they're a little bit weird and they go out at night. Um, so they find a body on the beach. So Nelson goes in to investigate, but there's all, they've also unearthed a, pre, um, a prehistoric, a Bronze Age site. So Ruth goes in to look at that too. And once again, she is drawn into the investigation and also into an investigation in a, in a very spooky and isolated farmhouse called Black Dog Farm, where there's been a shooting, uh, which then in, becomes in a rather sinister way to involve the Nighthawks and Ruth and Nelson. So I do hope you enjoy, there's lots of Norfolk, there's quite a lot of spookiness, lots of sort of, the, there's the legend of Black Shuck, who I know comes Suffolk way as well, I know he comes your way as well, so Black Shuck comes into it and all sorts of other sort of ghostly, mystical happenings. And related to the metal detectors in the book, Kathy has asked, have you ever done that yourself? Gone out oh. there and done a bit of metal detecting, and if you did or have, did you find anything? Hi, Kathy. Well, I've done a little bit. Um, Andy has got a, a metal detector. I mean, a lot of archaeologists do do that as well. And so we have been looking. Um, but it always seems that that Andy like has it for one second and he's like, oh, look, here is a um, medieval um, coffin nail. And I do it for one second and I find something he says, oh, no, that's just a bit of old car. So whatever I find is not at all. A, you know, we could be walking on the downs and he's like, oh, look, here is a, a Mesolithic um, arrowhead. And I find what looks like an identical stone. And he's like, no, that's just a stone. Uh, so I have done some metal detector. I've never found anything very interesting. There's a beach near us. Um, I live just outside Brighton where you can find quite a lot of so-called fool's gold, Alan Pyrites, and I've found a lot of that. So I don't think that's very exciting. It's quite exciting to me. It looks, it looks wonderful. It's sort of, sort of knobbly lump of sort of gold, but obviously it's not gold. But that's the most. That, that's what I find most. 
Brilliant. And one of the other questions that's just come through is from Lucy, something we've talked about even this evening before we start, of who would you cast for Ruth and Nelson? We, we know who we want for Nelson. Well, Nelson you know, sorted. We were just chatting about that, weren't we? You know, well, we've made the decision now, so really that's it. He but has to do it. He has to do um, it. So we, I've always thought uh, that Ruth Jones would be a good Ruth. Um, uh, I just think she, she looks very like the Ruth in my head and um, she's such a wonderful, intelligent actress as well. But I'm sure there are other people out there who could do it as well. Uh, but what, what Lisa and I were just saying before is that I'd always said that uh, Richard Armitage should be Nelson. Because in my head, I had this view of Nelson as being a bit like um, a young Ted Hughes. And there's a picture of Ted Hughes and he's sort of in wader standing in a stream. And that's the image I always had in my head of Nelson. And the actor who looks very like that is Richard Armitage. So my dream casting would probably be uh, Ruth Jones as Ruth, <laughs> and Lisa's on board with this, uh, Richard Armitage as Nelson, and uh, maybe David Tennant as Cathbad. Ooh, but let I me know. That. Let me know, uh, people listening, if you've got any other ideas, write them down. I was watching The Bay. I don't know if anyone else watched The Bay, really enjoyed it uh, on TV about um, set in Morecambe. And there was an actor in that called Owen McDowell, uh, McDonnell, Owen McDonnell. And I thought he would be a good Nelson as well. He had that slightly Ted Hughes-ish look. And I love your calf bad suggestion. David Tennant would be brilliant because he's kind of got that because yes. he's such an interesting character. He um, is for those a bit with his sort of long, in his long haired look, a bit mm. like because he's done that that really funny show in lockdown, hasn't he? And he's looking a bit sort of wild and and druid like. Yes. I think maybe that's what lockdown's done to him. But yes, he would be good, wouldn't he? Um, Debbie loves um, your Ruth Galloway series and wondered, do you know how many of the, how many do you envisage there being? Do we as readers get excited that there are many, many more to come? Oh, that's a great question, Debbie. I'm so glad you like the books. Um, there will be more. So uh, I'm writing 14 and the end is not the end. But I have to say, I don't think there'll be loads and loads more. I think I'm sort of. Well, I'm sort of coming up with not to an end, at least to a little break. I might just have a, a little break for a while. So I don't think there will be loads and loads more, but it's certainly, there certainly will be more and 14 is not the end. Oh, it's brilliant to know. And obviously when we've been talking about the book, I'll just say it's utterly brilliant. Oh, there, were, there were twists and turns, Ellie. I just did not see coming. You totally got me. And how you managed to intertwine the plot of the story in these different threads was genius, really brilliant. Oh, thank you. And do you as an author spend a lot of time plotting out your book before you start writing to make sure that all comes together at the end. I'm so glad, thank you so much. That's such a lovely thing to say. Um, well, do you know, I used to do like a little chapter plan. I would write like a couple of lines per chapter and just very brief, just, you know, chapter one, metal detectors find a body, chapter two, Ruth, Ruth goes to look at, um, goes to the beach to look at the body, that sort of thing. But I would write it all out till the end and I, know who did it and I'd write all that down but for the last sort of five books no four books since the stranger diaries which was my standalone book a couple of years ago three years ago um I haven't done a plan I haven't done a written plan and it's funny because I would say since the stranger diaries I've got the stranger diaries uh the the lantern men the night hawks postscript murders they've been my most complicated plots but I haven't actually written anything down for those. Um, I, I, you know, I write the odd note. I've got a, I've got a little, um, a little notebook next to me, and I often like sort of jot things down and you know scribble, scribble down sort of ideas and things like that. But I haven't written a, a, an actual plan. Um, so it is funny how they have come together, and these are kind of complicated plots. So I think maybe I might have just got a little bit more confident about uh, just going with the flow and seeing what's happened and sort of being confident that it will tie up. You know, now I sometimes think to myself as I write something, oh, oh, I, I know this will be significant, but I'm not quite sure why. And it does, well, touch wood again, lots of touching wood tonight. Touch wood has always come to me. So, and sometimes, you know, it's quite nice when there's somebody at the door and you don't know who that is as the writer. 
that's quite fun. That's quite fun and you can surprise yourself. Um, I, I was doing um, like a panel thing with, with a couple of American writers recently. And one of them said, oh, if you know who did it, the reader will know. And I don't think that's necessarily true. But I thought that was quite interesting that, that maybe when the author is a little bit in the dark as they go through, maybe that does make it trickier for the, for the reader to, to guess. I don't know. Quite interesting, though, isn't it? Um, Ruth, which um, you've kind of answered that this question already with that, Ellie, did ask, did you know how the series would develop when you first started it? I mean, and in part of that, did you know it would become this epic series where you're now writing book 14? No. Hi, hi Ruth. Great name. <laughs> um, no, I didn't. I Well, I, when I wrote the first book, The Crossing Places, I did kind of know that... Ruth and Nelson would sort of have a long story. But I didn't know really that I'd get to write it because previously I'd only written sort of uh, standalone books. I'd written four standalone books. When you can leave it at quite a, you leave the story at quite a crucial moment, like, you know, the two people have just got together or they've had a baby or they're going to have a baby or, you know, that's where you leave it. Um, and, and so I knew that when I finished The Crossing Bases, I had left Ruth and Nelson at quite a moment, but I wasn't sure that I was gonna get the chance to write it. So it does feel a real privilege in a way that I've been able to write their long story. You know, I've written that the next sort of 11 years of their lives have been in the books. And, and, and when something happens in, um, in fiction, it just happens. Of course, when it happens in life, we have to keep on living with it, you know, and that's what's happened with these books. There's been the consequences and day after day and what happens next. So, you know, I have I have felt very privileged to do that. But I, I although I did know there was a long story there, I never thought, goodness, I never, I thought if I was lucky, I'd be able to write a sequel, you know, and then I thought, or well, maybe I'll be able to write a trilogy. I never thought there would be 14 books and counting. No, never. Well, Diane has um, popped through a message to say she's read all 13 of them, oh. loves them all, and has also made a suggestion for Nelson, Tom Hardy. I think we can, we can agree. I think, yeah, that would work. I think so. I mean, we'd have to talk about it, you know, whether we, yeah, yes, that's a great idea, Tom Hardy. He's one of those actors, he could do anything as well, couldn't he? He'd be very good. He is. Like, obviously, he's quite big chap but then yes. he builds himself up for certain roles but he has kind of got a bit of an edge he has which got Nelson an edge does. and he's got a presence yes I like that and thank you very much I'm so glad you read all the books thank you and Heather who's also a huge fan of the series has asked for you Ellie do you have a favourite one out of, I mean is that too hard to choose out of all the books you've written for Ruth Galloway Oh, Heather, that's such a good question, but also very hard. It's very hard to answer. Um, gosh, um, there are some that, that I have enjoyed writing a lot, I guess. I, I, I think that's true. And I tell you, one of my favourites, perhaps my favourite to, to write, was The Ghost Fields. Um, and that's the one that starts when they find a, a Second World War plane uh, on, on, in, in, in Norfolk. And, and the trail leads back to a sort of... A, a rather eccentric group of aristocrats living in a deserted house. And I think I really enjoyed that because at the end uh, there, there are floods, which there were floods in Norfolk that year, and they all get sort of marooned in this spooky house. And I've always liked um, books where that happens. You know, uh, my favourite Georgia Hayes are always the one where they all get sort of stuck in, a, in an inn together. So I, but I had up till then never found a way to do it that wasn't kind of cheesy or obvious in the books. But the floods and that setting gave me the chance to actually maroon Ruth uh, in this house and also has I know I shouldn't have a favorite line in my books but my favorite line in my books is Ruth get behind the duck which is something that <laughs> Nelson says to her and I've got a, a lovely friend called Lynn who, who uh, I first met through these books she's American and a few years ago she uh, she came to the UK and she said can we meet up and I said yeah of course and we met at the London library and she was wearing a t-shirt that said Ruth get behind the duck how cool is that? That's awesome. And obviously, as well as this incredible series with Ruth Galloway, you, you've written many other books. And Jackie has recently read your Brighton Mysteries, has absolutely fallen in love with Edgar and Max, and would really like to know, are you planning to write more books for that series? 
Oh, thank you. Look, if you can see on my hand, it's upside down. I've written the word Brighton. And that's so as I could remember to mention the Brighton book. So thank you so much for your question. I don't need my little reminder there. Um, I'm so glad you like those books too. Thank you very much. It was Jackie, wasn't it? That? Thank you very much, Jackie. So glad you like those books. Uh, yes, there will be a new Brighton mystery this year, 30th of September. It's called The Midnight Hour. So the book started, for those of you who haven't read them, they're set in the 1950s. They start in the sort of theatrical world of the 1950s with a magician called Max Mephisto and a, a police officer called Edgar Stevens. Now in the new book, which is a Midnight Hour, we're up to 1965. And they're quite a wide cast of characters, including two women uh, um, private detectives who get involved in this book. So uh, yeah, sort of swinging 60s dark sequence of, the, uh, of a musical coming through, um, set in Rottingdean, which is village next near to me here. Funnily enough, I was talking first off about my very first, of course, unpublished book that I wrote when I was 11. That was also set in Rottingdean. So it's kind of interesting little circle there. And obviously, as well as the series of books, you have your standalones and um, the Postscript Murders, which came out last year. And I was just telling Ellie before we started, I absolutely loved it. It was such a joy to read. Oh, and um, without any spoilers about the book, are you able to tell us where you came up with this idea of a murder consultant? I'm so glad you like that book. Thank you. Um, yeah, Postcode Murders, and it's in paperback in, in April. Um, but for anyone who's waiting for that, but I know the libraries have it, have it in harbour, which is wonderful. Um, yes, well, the Postcode Murders starts when uh, an elderly lady in her 90s is, is found dead in her seafront retirement apartment. And everyone thinks, you know, it's really sad, but not really a surprise because she had heart condition, etc. But when her carer, who's called Natalka, is clearing out her room, she finds that, that, that Peggy, which is the lady's name, owned a lot of crime novels, a lot of mysteries, which is a bit suspicious. And then she sees that a lot of them are actually dedicated to Miss Peggy. A lot of them have her name in them. And a lot of them say things like, thanks for the murders. And then she finds some business cards which describe Peggy as a murder consultant. And it turns out that Peggy has a job thinking up murders for crime writers. Um, so Natalka takes this, this, uh, this find to the local police station where she meets D.S. Harbinder Kaur, who's also in The Stranger Diaries. And at first Harbinder's a little bit sceptical about this, but then a leading crime writer's found dead and she's um, drawn into the mystery. And I have to say, you ask about the inspiration, Lisa. Well, one of the inspirations of the book is actually my Aunt Marge. So my Aunt Marge uh, was a big, has always been a big supporter of, of the Ruth books because she lived in Norfolk and, you know, gave me a lot of Norfolk background. But a few years ago, about five years ago, she moved, she moved down south to be nearer us and to be nearer her son into a seaside apartment very much like the apartments in the Postscript Murders. And I don't know what it was. I don't know what it was, something about being near the sea. She had this balcony and this lovely view, but it just seemed to make Marge obsessed with murder. And she kept thinking of these great murder plots. And she would ring me up and, and I'd always know it was her because, you know, not many people use your landline now. Marge always used my landline. So, it, and I pick it up and it'd be, oh, hello, love. I was just thinking, could you murder somebody with a thurible? You know, and she would be, um, have these ideas all the time. So that gave me that thought of uh, what if there was such a thing as a murder consultant? And then what if she was murdered? But I hasten to say that I did square that with Marge first and she thought that was fine. And she's alive and well and still thinking up murders. So she's fine. A real life Peggy. A real life Peggy. Yeah, definitely. And also a little bit of my mum too, because my mum's sadly not with us anymore. But my mum was such a great reader. She read so much, um, loved her local library. You know, she was such a great reader. And it meant that, she knew a hell of a lot because people who read a lot know a lot don't they and uh, Peggy is a bit like that too and I did I was actually going to ask you because I felt like the characters you know Peggy Edwin Benedict the the, the rich characters in the oh. book felt so real so I did wonder if some of them were based on people you knew which was obviously the case which is oh. Perfect. Oh, thank you. I'm so glad that you said that. Um, 
the other case I suppose is not anyone based in but um my mum my um, auntie marge was um very friendly with the guy who ran the local coffee place uh, and and of course one of the main characters in this book is the guy who runs the local coffee place i hasten to say benedict is not based on marge's coffee guy but that is where i got that idea from but i did a lovely event a few weeks ago with west sussex libraries and uh, Katie, the, the librarian there, was really excited because Peggy in the book, I'm sure you clocked this, Lisa, she worked at Shoreham Library. So uh, there's a little library link there as well. And Franklin, who's reading the Postscript Murders oh. at the moment, um, said that he felt like there was quite a difference, and I know what he means, between your um, Ruth Galloway series uh, books and obviously your latest standalone, The Postscript Murders. And was that deliberate or, you know, because obviously the setting's so much different and, you know, it's less misty, isn't it? The, 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 the location, you're at a seaside place obviously they go on their adventures and travels in the book i won't give any spoilers there where you know they there's been murders and trying yes, to yeah. find out what's happened but it was the is there a, a deliberateness from you as a writer to bring a different tone to these series and standalones it's really interesting hi frank i'm so glad you're enjoying it it's interesting because i don't think i stepped out to write in a different style say but, but what, it, what was different that I hadn't done before is there was a kind of different structure because with, with the Ruth books, you're either really most of the time seeing things through Ruth's eyes or through Nelson's. But in this book, I decided to do each chapter would be from a different character's point of view. So it's either Natalko's the carer, Harbinder, who's the detective, uh, Benedict, the cafe owner, or Edwin, uh, um, Peggy's neighbor. So the four of them, uh, the book, it, they have a chapter each as, as you go through the book. So I think there was a different structure. So possibly it, it did make the book a little different. And as Lisa says, of course, you're not in Norfolk, we're in, in Shoreham by sea. And then you go on a, on a road trip, they go up to Scotland. Um, so you do have different, and, and I hope you do have a kind of sense of place as well. But I think the structure was different. So maybe that is what makes it seem different. But it's mm. interesting, isn't it? Because I would say that as a writer, I don't set out to write in a different way. But I can see as well that the bright and mysteries set in the 50s set in that theatrical world they have a different feeling to the Ruth books mm -hmm. and it is interesting and maybe the Ruth books are all a little different from each other I haven't really thought about that before but maybe that's true too so it is interesting I think it's a really interesting point and um, obviously you write an extraordinary we're talking about now an extraordinary amount of books Ellie and Susan has asked and would love to know what's one of your favorite things to do when you're not writing all these amazing books Oh, Susan, thank you uh, for that question. Yes, well, well, one of the things I love to do is I love to swim. I'm, I'm a really keen swimmer and uh, I do swim in the sea and I do swim all year round. Um, and it's very cold. <laughs> so I live, I live very near the sea in, in Brighton. Um, and, and I do, I, I always, I've always swum, but it's only the last couple of years I've swum all through winter as well. Not in a wetsuit, I hasten to tell you, I'm much tougher than that. Though I do have like little feet and hand things because they get cold. But yeah, so there's nothing like, I absolutely love sea swimming. Um, I do swim in swimming pools when they're open, but for me, it's nothing. The sea is where I like to swim. So yeah, so I like to swim in the sea. I like to go on long walks. Um, I love, um, you know, just going for walks and finding things and going rock pools and, and finding stuff like that. Um, when we were allowed to, I loved going to the theatre and the cinema and going out with friends. But also very, very keen. The other thing I'm really keen on is horse riding, which I haven't been able to do during lockdown uh, because I used to ride a little way away from here. But yeah, I absolutely love horses and uh, used to ride regularly. So horse riding and swimming are my two kind of favourite non-booky things to do. And I mean, when you do you get much time to read? Because Mike has asked, which I know we've talked about before, would you tell us a little bit about your favourite authors and authors that just really inspire you? Oh my, what a great question. Yeah, I do read a lot. I mean, I, you know, I know probably all of us here do, don't we? Because we're all booky people. And the, when you're a writer, you don't kind of stop reading because that's what you do. Um, yeah, well, I absolutely love 
books and reading also I'm really sort of wide range you don't just read crime I read, read all sorts of things um probably the writer that's inspired me most is Wilkie Collins I love Victorian um writers I I did a master's in Victorian literature a long time ago but it's still a bit useful um and I would say Wilkie Collins certainly influenced me in uh, the Stranger Diaries which is a sort of rather gothic mystery um so yeah, so he was definitely an inspiration behind that. And also the way he writes about place in uh, Moonstone, you know, and he writes about the shivering sand. So I love, I love Wilkie Collins, I love Dickens. Um, I love Emma James, those sort of ghost stories. Modern writers, I'm very keen on David Lodge, Alison Lurie. I'm reading an Alison Lurie book at the moment called Truth and Consequences. I, I love American writers actually, big fan of Donna Tartt as well, um, and Tyler. Modern crime writers that I really like, there's so many. I have to say, I do think we're in a golden age of crime writing. It sounds a bit big headed for me to say that because there's me uh, in it. But, you know, Leslie Thompson, are you, has everyone read Leslie Thompson's Detective Daughter series? They're fantastic. She's a good friend of mine as well. William Shaw, his uh, amazing uh, Alex Cooper books. Uh, Ruth Ware, love her books in a dark, dark wood. That's a really good one. Erin uh, Kelly, who's got a new one out about ballet dancers. That's really brilliant. Sarah Hillary, the Marnie Rome books. Jane Casey, Maeve Kerrigan, um, Val McDermott, Ian Rankin. So I do think there are a lot of amazing. Um, Will Dean, I don't know if there are any Will Dean fans out there. He's a really great, really good crime writer. I has a lovely series set in Sweden um, called, about a detective called Tuva Moodison. But he's just written a new book and it's called The Last Thing to Burn. And I really recommend it. It's a very tense, quite short book. Really, really, really tense. So Last Thing to Burn, I recommend. And as someone else has also asked, right, right now, Ellie, what book are you reading? What's by your bedside table? Well, I'm actually halfway through the Alison Leary book, Truth and Consequences. Sadly, Alison Leary died, I think, this year or at the end of last year. So really sad about that. And I thought I'd read all her books, but then I found this one. So I, I'm reading that at the moment. And prior to that... I had just read um, uh, Ruth Ware's In a Dark Dark Wood. Um, and the one before was also a Ruth where I can't remember which one it was. Oh, The Death of Mrs. Westaway, which I loved quite gothic. And Tricia, who's also read all of your books, who's watching at the moment, has asked, will COVID lockdown ever come into your books? Is it something you want to explore as a writer? That's a really good question, Tricia. And that was Tricia, wasn't it? Um, yeah. Uh, because I can't see them, so I'm just, um, yes, it will. So Ruth 14 is called The Locked Room and it takes place in 2020. And I, I know that along with a lot of writers, and I've talked with this a lot of, with my writer friends, we, we have talked a lot about whether we should write or would want to write about it or should even write about lockdown. And I don't know whether I would if I was writing a standalone novel, but my view was that I've been writing this Ruth series year after year. You know, there's been a book a year and it's covered a year. Um, so I felt that it would be very strange to miss out 2020. And I sort of felt I should write about it and that people might want to find out what happened to Ruth and Nelson and Cathbad and the rest of the gang in lockdown. You know what, you can just, well, I'm writing at the moment, of course, Cathbad in some senses is absolutely living, loving it. You know, who is better suited to homeschooling and growing his own vegetables? And, you know, the moment he's quite enjoying it, he soon won't. But um, so, so I did, I have decided to write about it. So the book starts in, in, in February of 2020, when nobody really knows what's ahead of them so that book will cover lockdown um and it and you know it, it will explore how the characters feel about each other as well so so that's the one I'm writing at the moment but it is an interesting one and I think that I would have thought twice if I was writing standalone but but it would have felt very odd to have missed out 2020 it's sort of not quite right because and also if I didn't set it in 2020 because uh, the night talks is 2019 if I hadn't set it in 20 if I just missed that out I would have had to write in the future it would have to be set in 2021 and who knows what's happening who knows what's going to happen in 2021? Touch wood again, touch wood, It'll, you know, things are getting better, but I, I wouldn't have felt comfortable writing in the future. 
And you were just obviously then, Ellie, mentioning Kath Bad's character and Pat, who absolutely loves all your books. It's a common theme for this evening. That's so nice. Lovers, huge fans of yours. And she's read them all. And she really wanted to know, like, how did his character come about? And that it's so realistic. Um, she wants to visit Ruth's cottage. <laughs> Oh, hi, Pat. Thank you so much for that comment. Um, Kath Bad, so, so in the first in the first Ruth book, uh, The Crossing Places, uh, Kath Bad was in a way just just another character. You know, I, I the book centers around the, the Bronze Age henge that was genuinely found on North Norfolk coast. And when the archaeologists dismantled the henge and excavated it, they took the timbers away to preserve them. But th there was a lot of protest about that. And the protest was led by local Druids. And I do think that's very Norfolk, but maybe it's Suffolk too, uh, to just have local Druids for them just to be a thing. Um, and so I knew there would be a Druid character and that he would have that as his motive, that he was angry that the hen had been excavated. So that's where Cathbad came from. I do have a good friend who's a Druid though, um, somebody who was at school with me uh, and we both, uh, brought up Catholic, went to Catholic schools, but she's gone another way in her life and she's now a Druid. So I have, you know, she's, you know, advised me on, on some of those elements of, of uh, Cathbad's uh, beliefs. Um, and also, you know, because of her, I really wanted to, to treat his, his beliefs very respectfully, as I hope I would anyone's belief. So, but it has been a bit of a surprise to me how much Cathbad has grown as a character so now you know in book 13 and the night talks he's one of the main characters in it and he's had his own character arc and he's done his own uh you know he's he's had his own ups and downs really in the series so it's been quite a surprise to me how much he's changed um well actually i'm not sure that he has changed but i think that, that our attitude towards him has changed you know because if you have a friend who's a little bit eccentric and wears a purple cloak and keeps turning up at odd occasions after a bit you get used to them and you think oh that's just Cathbad. and one of the bits i liked in the night talks was when in a moment of great stress nelson arrives to find Cathbad in the middle of it all meditating and you know we're just used to Cathbad doing things like that so i'm really glad you like him thank you he's he's a fantastic character and a brilliant contrast to someone like nelson um and when we were talking about who might play them someone else has um helen has said about olivia coleman as ruth and yeah maybe i i'm a big fan actually of olivia coleman I, she's I am. she's such a great actress um that, that maybe while she doesn't in my head look much like Ruth, I would know that she could do it. And actually, she's from Norfolk, isn't she? So yeah. maybe she would bring that Norfolkness. I wonder if she's the Coleman Mustaf family, because that's Norfolk. I don't know, but I know that she's from Norfolk, and I know when she was on Who Do You Think You Are, she was saying how important Norfolk was to her. So, yeah, it's a good thought. And several people have been talking about the um, postscript murders in the comments. And Angela has asked, she loved the characters. I totally agree with you, Angela. They're fantastic, rich characters. And wondered, would you consider doing a sequel to that, bringing back the, that trio to go and solve another murder? Oh, Angela, I'm so glad you enjoyed the book. Um, I, I always want, intended to write, I think, one more that had Harbinder in it. And I had not intended, to be honest with you, to write about those characters again, but it's never happened to me in such a strong way that I've missed characters. And when I finished writing that book, I suppose because I, I just thought it was a, a, a standalone, I really did miss Edwin and Arbinda and, and um, Natalka and Benedict. So I really did miss them. So it's, it's, not, it's not impossible that I might not write, write them into another book. I, I just do want to write about them again. I do kind of miss them. It's funny, really. But I'm so glad you enjoyed it. And as we've already talked about, um, Ellie, you've written so many different books and Sarah was asking, like, because of that, do you ever feel pressurised with deadlines with your publisher to come up with all these great ideas for the next book? Oh, that's a really great, you know, insightful question. Um, on one hand, on one hand, I feel really lucky because, you know, I, I, I have, you know, a Con, con, a contract to, to write books and I have somebody waiting for them like I have a publisher who wants to publish them and you know my goodness if you told 
you know, 18 year old me that that would be the case. I would have been beside myself with happiness. And it is great, but there is pressure, no doubt about it. I'm at the moment contracted to write two books a year. Oh, and I should say that I also, this year, you're going to get a new justice book, you know, the series that I do for, for younger readers. So there's a new justice book out this year as well. That will so be, I'll, I'll just mention, Ellie, that'll be great news for Philippa, who's already asked about that because oh. she's recently introduced her daughter to them, who absolutely loves them. Oh, that's so lovely to hear, Philippa. Thank you. Yes, there'll be a new one. Justice 3, The Ghost in the Garden comes out in May. So that is actually three books a year. And, and although I love writing them, there, there, there is a moment, yeah, where you think, especially, especially when you have the discussions with your publisher and, and they say, so um, what's going to happen in Ruth 15 or uh, what's going to happen in Brighton Murders 8? And you think, I don't know, you know. I don't know what's or the really scary moment is when you see that there's a cover for it and you think whoa there's a cover for it and I don't know and I remember with um with uh I think it was with the stranger diaries I was writing it and the cover was there you know on, on sort of social media and it stood on it has a shocking twist and I thought well it's shocking to me because I haven't written it yet I haven't written it yet so, you know, I said earlier on about you being surprised by your own stuff. Well, sometimes, so yeah, sometimes there is a bit of that, that but then again, I think a lot of us find um, that we need a deadline. And one of the things that I was just saying, I teach creative writing, one of the great things about going on a creative writing course or a creative writing group or something is that then you have a deadline. And I don't know if everyone out there is like me, but if you're told you have to write something by next week, you do do it. You know, and you don't have the luxury of sitting around. Uh, my first published book probably took me seven years to write. But, you know, I don't have that luxury. So you just have to get writing. And sometimes getting writing is really good. It's what you need to do. So, um, yeah, so it cuts both ways. A bit of stress, a bit of stress. Um, but also I'm pretty grateful to be able to, to do it, I have to say. I think you're right um, with what you said there, Ellie, because it is a motivator. Otherwise, it's like this endless time period and there's no demands on you and you might never do it. And you and can just sit there forever. And I'm not criticising this because it's fun to do, because sit there researching it forever, couldn't you? But but if somebody says you've got to start it now, if I was to say out there to all you writers in the audience tonight, you've got to start it, start it, start writing it. You know, you would. And, and obviously, carry on. when you said you're contracted to write two books a year, Val has asked, like, how long does it take to write the book? And obviously, there's a there's different processes, isn't there? Because you've got research that you might do for the book, then the actual writing, and then there'll be edits, and then you know, it's it's a long process. But the actual sitting down and writing the the main first draft, how long does that usually take you? Well, it's a bit that's a really good question it links into the one before because it takes me six months because that's how long it has to take me do you know what I mean if, if I had yeah. longer it would take me longer but I know that sort of from uh January to August I'm writing a Ruth book from August to February I'm writing the next one so that's how long that takes me really um so but but yes one of the things is that while I'm writing one sometimes I'm researching thinking about the other one I only really do one draft. I, I don't. I, um, so the, whilst I'm thinking about it, you know, whilst I'm whilst I'm writing the book, the ideas are going round in my head quite a lot, and so my final draft is quite clean. You know, I don't go back over and change it that much. I do obviously go back to the beginning and read it again, and obviously there are going to be bits that need you know tidying up or something, but. Generally speaking, if you were to look over my shoulder in here in the shed when I'm writing, that's what you will see on the final page. So I'm not a writer who does loads of drafts, which does help with, with the deadline. So basically, yeah, basically Ruth books, I start them in, um, I start in about end of January and deliver in, in August, which I think is about seven months actually. But my birthday is in August. And funnily enough, I have the same birthday as my editor, 17th of August. And so every year she says, oh, deliver it on our birthday, which is kind of lovely, but also means that my birthday is always a slightly, you know, dreaded deadline. But so far I've always delivered it before, so I'm not stressed on our birthday. 
And um, obviously, we've already talked, I've mentioned it, and there's a lot of people in the comments talking about these extraordinary characters that you create and the journeys that they go on in your books. Because obviously, you know, they are crime books, but they have all these different experiences. And are they ever based on your own experiences in any way? Things that you may have done? That's a really interesting question. I'm so glad people like the characters. Like for me, you know, characters are the most important thing because um, if, if people don't relate to your characters, then your books have no tension, do they? Because that's what comes from caring about the characters. So that's the nicest thing that I could hear, really. Um, I haven't used that many of my own experiences in my writing. And funnily enough, I probably did use the ones that I was going to use up in my first four Domenica de Rosa books. Um, which, you know, probably do relate a little bit more to, to some family stories, anyhow, because they're about Italy and families and relationships and that sort of thing. So by the time I got to be Ellie Griffiths, I'd kind of used up my real life experience. Um, but like all writers, you do take things from everywhere, don't you? And, and equally, it's funny, really, because my family, um, I think, you know, they look at the Domenica Droza books and they think, oh, am I in it? But they don't think that about the Ruth books, but they could still be in those, couldn't they? It would just be disguised. And uh, so I'm probably still in those, but just more of a disguise. So, you know, I'm not an archaeologist. Uh, I'm not in the police. You know, I haven't done these things. And I'm, I'm uh, you know, the, the Brighton Mystery is very much based on my granddad's life uh, as, as a musical entertainer. He was a comedian um, and, and sort of I, I took a lot of inspiration from his old playbills and things like that. So I suppose there was an element of that playing here, but it wasn't something that I'd personally done. Um, so I do take inspiration from places and from, you know, uh, stories and folklore and things like that. But so not really from my own experiences. You know, I, I'm not an archaeologist. I'm not an atheist. I don't work at a university. I'm not in the police. Um, but but I feel I can write about those things. <laughs> I just wanted to go through because obviously there are an awful lot of comments and questions coming through and I just wanted to go through some of the people and what they've been saying. Oh, brilliant. So um, Helen and Rose, Rosie, sorry, have both um, written about how much they love your books. They're mm -hmm. utterly fantastic. Kristen Bella has said, has said the same and that she's a huge fan, along with Lynn, who's tuning in from California, which oh, is remarkable. That's my friend Lynn. Get behind the dark. Hi, Lynn. Oh, is it? Oh, wonderful. Yeah, I'm pretty um, sure it is. And then um, Philippa said something really quite wonderful, well, she's extraordinary, that she absolutely loves your books. And she got, you know, it helped her get through dark days while she was going through cancer treatments. Mm -hmm. And like, you know, that solace of being able to read one of your extraordinary books. And I, I was quite moved when I read that. So thank you so much, Philippa, for sharing oh, that yes, with us. Yes, Philippa, and wishing you all the very best, because I know how books can help. So I'm so moved that mine have helped you. Because we do need that sometimes, sort of escapism, especially in the last year. It's not been the easiest year for a lot of people. There's been a, a huge upheaval in the world. And, you know, the escapism of a, an excellent book, a bit of music. As you said, Ellie, you like to go for walks. Um, Anthony Horwitz was saying the same thing, actually. When we launched our festival on Monday, he likes to go for a walk with the dog and, like, clear his head. And, that you know, we need that as a bit of balance sometimes, I think, in our lives. We do. And, and books have been, and, and I know that's why you've done such a wonderful job, Lisa, the libraries, keeping, managing to keep the libraries open. I know you're open. To, to pick up and drop off books but also online because people have so needed that and one of the first things that I did I think this time last year when when all this was starting and it was even more scary I think names we didn't know I was just dived right into my um uh, Georgia Hare books you know and I was away there you know in Regency times and uh, because that that was solace you know that was comfort and so I do know how comforting books can be so if mine have comforted any of you guys I'm so happy and I feel a bit like we've been on the journey together then so uh yes the, Ruth and Nelson are beside you and Cathbad sending you positive thoughts and that's just reminded me, actually, you saying that, Ellie, that those of you that aren't yet following Ellie on Facebook, do check out her Facebook page because over the last year she has been reading 
from her books, which has been absolutely fabulous. And I think that also from our last event last year in October, brought people a lot of comfort and joy to have that story each day where oh. Ellie was reading from her books. Oh, that's really nice. Yes, I did. That was something that, that happened again when we first went into lockdown, you know, in, in March uh, 2020, I decided to, to read The Crossing Bases aloud. So it's a, a chapter a day on my Facebook page. And that was partly just because I love being read to and I do find it comforting. So, but so now if you scroll down through my Facebook page, you've got, I've, I've read the whole of The Crossing Bases, the whole of what the first Girl Called Justice book and uh, the whole of the zigzag girl which is the first brighton mystery so they're all there somewhere and i i will i will i think you know for this year is that i'll do another one so uh, yeah I, I really enjoyed that i didn't know what you know what a big thing it would become people just seem to like it so much and actually it was really nice for me every day doing the recording and seeing people's comments and things like that so i think i really really will do it and it also made me really respect the people who read my books on audible the, the proper professional people because it's pretty hard to do it you know and i really enjoyed it and i did a lot of very bad accents along the way um and, and a lot of them my cats there walking across the screen it's not super professional but i did really enjoy doing it. well i was at, i want to finish um with the last question with you ellie of what's one of the things you love most about being an author and what you were just talking about i think might be one of them is there anything else that you just brings you so much joy or one of your favorite things having this career and being such a successful writer Oh, what a great question. I cannot believe we're at the end of our hour. It's, it's whiz past, isn't it? It's whiz past. Um, really, as you said, as you guessed, the, the, the best thing has been this, this, what we're doing here now and what we do in person. It's sharing books uh, with, with other readers, you know. But I've always found that booky people are nice people, so readers and librarians and booksellers and, you know, I think we've all got so much in common because because we love books and um, so it is, it's just the thought that when you publish a book that, that it would give joy to people, you know, some of the things that you've read out to now, you know, that's what it's about. That's what it's about. If you could write a book that is going to make somebody feel better, well then, then it's worth it. It really, yeah. really is really really is worth it so you know definitely that is the is the very best thing about it and the other wonderful thing is is you know being able to escape being able to escape to another world you know and, and I feel very lucky to be able to do that and if you can't sleep you've always got something to think about and if you're going on a walk you know and then you know and hey what Anthony says you know go for a walk and it often clears a, a plot, plot problem in your head if, if I'm swimming out there in the freezing seas it gives me something to think about so how lucky am I to be able to do that and how lucky I am to have people to read them I, I really do feel lucky Thank you so much. I just wanted to also, again, just mention the books of Ellie's that we've been talking about this evening. So The Postscript Murders, that came out last year, as we've talked about, absolutely fabulous characters, um, murder consultant. Uh, we won't do any spoilers, but I, I just, oh, and Ellie's got it too. Well, this um, is the American edition. Mentioned. It's interesting oh, yes. how different it is. I always find that fascinating because sometimes they change the title as well for the American audience. Yes. And um, do check out The Postscript Murders. It's a, a gorgeous read, um, fabulous characters, brilliantly plotted. And of course, and that's also, as Ellie mentioned, out in April in paperback. And then obviously Ellie's most recent book, The Nighthawks, the 13th instalment, who knew we would get this far, is awesome for us as readers, of um, the Ruth Galloway series, brilliantly intertwined plots, um, will twist and turn, late nights were involved, um, so I highly recommend that, utterly brilliant. And I'd just like to finish off this evening by thanking you all for joining us. We are beyond grateful for your support of Suffolk Libraries and our annual fundraising. And if you'd like to know more ways about how you can support us and the amazing and essential services that we provide, you can see details of that on our website. When this live event concludes, you will be directed 
to our Facebook page a group called Discover Reads. Please do join. As well as this week's book festival, we have regular author events every month now, and you will find links to purchase the latest books of the authors taking part in this week's festival on our Facebook page, on our website, and in that Discovery Facebook group. Amazingly, we still have another six events taking place this week. Our next one is with Nikki French tomorrow, the crime um, couple duo. So do join us if you can, that would be amazing. Thank you all again for coming. And of course, I mean, Ellie, it's always just such a delight to speak to you. Thank you so much for your your time this evening oh thank you so much thank you everyone that tuned in i really do appreciate your support and the support at least of you and suffolk libraries and guys suffolk libraries is an amazing resource and and we've we've talked here about how important the bookish community is and, and they are the living embodiment of that so thank you so much thank you to libraries everywhere suffolk libraries and thanks to everyone who's come along tonight i do appreciate you